Good evening. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to today's town hall. Throughout the academic year, this series has covered a lot of ground in our quest towards structural transformation. In the process, we have explored thought-provoking topics about social justice. As members of a public research university, we strive to achieve ideals of social justice in everything we do, whether in our research, our scholarship, the education of our students, or our artistic expression. That is how we uphold UB's mission of excellence. We value the role our artists and our cultural spaces play in cultivating a spirit of inquiry at UB and in the greater community. If we use our creative expressions to amplify diverse voices and perspectives, we also amplify the relevance of our work in society. By acting on our inclusive values, we can make a truly profound impact on the communities we serve. From our founding, the University at Buffalo has always been driven to serve the greater good. We consider it not only our responsibility, but also our privilege to do so. With that, I would like to thank all of you for participating in today's discussion. And without further ado, allow me to introduce today's moderator, Liz Park, Curator of Exhibitions at UB Art Galleries. Thank you, President Satish Tripathi, for the welcome, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. My name is Liz Park, and I am the Curator of Exhibitions at UB Art Galleries. I'd like to begin our program with an acknowledgement that the land that I am on and the land on which the University at Buffalo operates is the territory of the Seneca Nation, a member of the Haudenosaunee Six Nations Confederacy. This territory is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Treaty of Peace and Friendship, a pledge to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. It is also covered by the 1794 Treaty of Canandaigua between the United States government and the Six Nations Confederacy, which further affirmed Haudenosaunee land rights and sovereignty in the state of New York. Today, this region is still home to the Haudenosaunee people, and we are grateful for the opportunity to live, work, and share ideas in this territory. I share this acknowledgement as a starting point for the difficult and ongoing work of truly contending with the full implications of our participation in various colonial settler societies and institutions such as UB. I hope that our discussions today serve as an opportunity to question the assumptions and the structures of power within our own institutions, and importantly, to explore steps toward making spaces of redress. And this is where us three curators come in. We make space for art, ideas, culture, politics, one another. And I proposed this roundtable discussion to the Office of Inclusive Excellence last year as I was grappling with what it means to be a curator in a university art organization during a time of multiple crises, a global pandemic and economic deprivation, both of which disproportionately affects black, indigenous and people of color. What does it mean to be a curator, a caretaker of art and culture when people are out on the street to protest a larger system of oppression that targets certain groups of people while the capitalist market thrives in appropriation of their resources and cultural materials. I wanted to hear from colleagues who I know are similarly reflective of their roles as curators in modeling a cultural landscape that is just and diverse with insight and acumen with the aim of forging paths forward in our field. So it is my pleasure and honor to introduce Candace Hopkins and Yasomi Umalu.
Candace Hopkins is a citizen of Car Cross Tagish First Nation and lives in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Her writing and curatorial practice explores the intersection of history, contemporary art, and indigeneity. She was part of the curatorial team for the Canadian Pavilion for the 58th Venice Biennale and co curated many notable exhibitions, including. Art for New Understanding, Native Voices, 1950s to Now, and the 2018 site Santa Fe Biennial, titled Casa Tomada, Documenta 14 in Athens, Greece, and Castle, Germany, among many others. Uh, she has served as senior curator for the 2019 Toronto Biennial of Art and is currently working on the 2021 edition, which was now postponed to open in spring 2020. 22 due to COVID and I hope that our borders open up soon and we can all travel freely to visit the exhibition in the spring. And Yasomi Umalu joins us from London where it is past 10.30 p.m. So thank you so much for staying up late to be part of this conversation. After many years in the U.S., Somi finds herself back in London, where she is the recently appointed Director of Curatorial Affairs and Public Practice at the Serpentine Galleries. She was previously Director and Curator of Logan Center Exhibitions at the University of Chicago, where she also taught courses in visual art and spatial practices. Prior to joining the Logan, Somi held curatorial positions at the MSU Broad Museum in Michigan, Walker Art Center in Minneapolis, and Manifesta 8, the European Biennial of Contemporary Art. And she was most recently the artistic director of the 2019 Chicago Architecture Biennial. So welcome, Candace and Somi. Uh, in preparation for tonight's conversation, I shared with them four broad questions which are, what role do art and artists play in times of need? What responsibilities do museums have in representing cultures past and present and modeling the cultures we want in the future? And what are the limits of museums as sites of knowledge? What are the potentials of the museum as a place of refuge, inspiration, and life-affirming power? So, as a way to start this conversation, Candace has generously prepared a short five minute introduction to her curatorial practice that'll help us understand her approach and perspectives. After which I will introduce Somi's curatorial perspective by briefly sharing a text uh, that she has written called On the Limits of Care and Knowledge, 15 Points Museums Must Understand to Dismantle Structural Injustice. And then we will move into a conversation exploring these questions together, including enough time at the end for questions from the audience before wrapping up at 6.30. So with that, uh, I will turn over the virtual floor to you, Candice. Thank you, Liz. Um, and thank you for that really generous introduction. Um, I'm also so excited to speak about this and by way of entering the discussion, I wanted to share, um, as Liz said, just a few images and put some ideas on the table, let's say. Most of them are questions and most of them are questions stemming from my thinking and writing around museums and their relationships, particularly to indigenous people. So um, I'll share my screen and I'll, I'll just jump right in. So I'm interested in the ways that museums have consumed culture, particularly indigenous culture. In obsessively rendered drawings of the Ojibwe artist Andrea Carlson, like this one you see here, she asks questions of how dominant culture, let's say white US or Western European came to identify others, came to identify others as exotic and as others themselves. She considers this a kind of cultural cannibalism that sensationalizes while at the same time objectifies and consumes. 
even as our cultures, as indigenous cultures are often, there's attempts to erase us through policy and assimilation. At the center of this image is a Tower of Babel and it rests on an upside down base of the same tower, a kind of infinite regress of the eating of the other. And then the words Mondo Cain, which references a cannibal cult film from 1962 that was a kind of shockumentary where the directors mixed both archival footage and things that they kind of reenacted. And they put, placed it on an unsuspecting public and also posed it as entirely factual. But their footage of various non-Western cultures and stage scenes were of course entirely false. So in Andrea Carlson's painting and drawings, cultures are, are kind of continually cannibalized by one another, but it's a way of her speaking to how museums are the things that often have the largest appetites. So here we see a vessel and it's, it looks like a pre-Columbian vessel or pre-Incan vessel, but the arms of the small clay monkey grasp, grasp its neck. It's a digital replica of this vessel, it's been rubbed dark with graphite and out of its neck comes a recorded voice. It's a seed pod actually, with its outer shell peeled away and that forms the vessel's body. I've been thinking lately about galleries as vessels, as, of museums as vessels, of entanglements as well. And I think this digital presence of this piece calls to the original as well. And the original was made by the Chumi people and it's not an artifact. It's not an artifact spelled variously with an E or an I, but it's a cultural belonging. Museums with their lingering primitivist ideologies and tendencies towards salvage anthropology have tried with little success to rid these belongings of their agency, first by separating them from their people. Seeing this vessel now is a reminder that its true home is elsewhere with others, even perhaps this 3D copy. Its life cycle has been interrupted by museums. It lives there in a kind of permanent stasis, the non-life of the cultural object. Museums suspend death and decay while simultaneously defending their bounty from the living. This might include organisms, insects, rot, and even the human touch. So the artist Harold Mendez's gesture is a form of digital repatriation. It's not necessarily focused on the object's return as a historical corrective, however much that's needed but on its recapitulation through the invention of new homes for it, of new dwellings and of new worlds for the copies. And museums are working in this area of the copies rather well now, but differently because they're not entirely willing to let go of their hordes and they too are making copies. They're producing exacting prints of things like ceremonial masks by first photographing every aspect of them or scanning them, including their insides. So now printed in 3D in plastic are eyes that were carved by hand, articulated wooden mouths, eyes at once whale and human, ermine skin, a baloney shell, even the mass imperfections are replicated. And then they're sending these Erstat ceremonial masks back to their communities so that local artists can complete them based on a mix of customary and invented protocols. They're painting them as though they're made of wood, they're adding leather ties to them, they're fixing other animal skin, hair, shell, and other items. And then they're dancing these new masks and abridge ceremonies that take place inside the museums. And the newly authenticated copy has truly come home. While returning the original masks back to the community, the museums are showing their copies in their place. And given the pandemic age, it's worth reiterating that one of the reasons museums give for not returning our things is that they've been poisoned. They've been sickened by the institution's treatment in the early days of collecting when they would douse the things entering their holdings with arsenic. This was a true performance of fearing contamination by the other yet wanting our things nonetheless. Now our things can't come home because they are toxic. I'm beginning to think of the idea of repatriation otherwise, an idea that Perhaps we've become too focused on the return of their things as this is yet another colonial trap, another way for them to say no. And that perhaps our frame of reference is too predicated on the colonial protocols of the museum instead of the protocols of the originary cultures and the protocols of the belonging itself. And perhaps the focus does not need to be always on its return, 
but to find other ways of being with them, being with our things, being with our wealth, of making them a part of us, of our bodies, of our communities. Because in this way, repatriation begins to lose some of its fixity, becomes more malleable and something that we can shape for our own uses and our own ends. And to conclude, I'd say that I'm also thinking of those who mobilize the potential of embodying a belonging by bringing it closer to home. One is, an, is the artist Tanya Lucan Linklater and her collaborators. And Tanya recently did this by making a link between the absent body of the gut skin parka you see pictured here that was made for someone, someone's body. And we wear one another. The work was realized in collaboration with the parka, the Apache viol violinist Laura Ortman, and dance dancers Kaiwen Gobert and Dana Rosales. Through her extended engagement, they developed new choreographies and new music and new songs. Their question was how the parka itself could be a score for engagement. So while visiting the parka at the Manitoba Museum and its now permanent home, Tanya learned as much as she could about the migration of this cultural belonging. Because when our things often come into museums, the histories that are layered onto them are often fragmented, they're filled with gaps and they're filled with silences. More often than not, more is known about the collector, and this is mainly white men, than the name of the maker and who she made this for. By simply being with this belonging in a gesture of repatriation otherwise, is it possible to amend some of these silences and gaps in knowledge and upend its attendant hierarchies? Is this a part of the restore and the repair? Thank you so much, Candace, for a very generous introduction to some of the thinking that you have been doing uh, through your curatorial work. Um, we will put in the chat box for all the audience uh, a link to an essay that Candace has written called Outlawed Social Life in case anyone is interested in exploring more. Um, and while Jared is doing that, uh, I will start sharing my screen so that we can introduce uh, Somi's curatorial perspective. So just give me one second, there we go. So as a way to frame her curatorial perspective and to begin our conversation, I wanted to bring a few key points from Somi's 2020 uh, opinion piece on Artnet uh, titled On Limits of Care and Knowledge. And I won't read through all 15 points, but I want to point out a few of them uh, because it will help frame our discussion. So I will scroll down to the first point. Museums are built on the ideological foundation of being repositories of knowledge and spaces of care in service of civic society in the Western world. The history of museums is tied to the colonial impulse to collect and amass objects from the world over, charging specialist caretakers and scientists with their interpretation. I'm going to skip down to five care in museums has expanded from a focus on safeguarding things and building Western art history in the 19th century to the reification of audience engagement in the 21st century. One of my favorite points. Scroll down to nine. If museums amass knowledge and care for things, then we must ask ourselves, in the midst of the social upheavals and global health pandemic of recent days, months, and years, for whom do they do this? Point 11, to acknowledge the limits of your knowing and caretaking is an important step. 14, the task is to commit to practices of knowing and care that critically interrogate the fraught history of museums and their contemporary form uprooting weak foundations and rebuilding upon new healthy ones. And then the last, let us know and care for the other, ourselves and society at large 
in equal measure without prejudice. Let us know and care about bodies and their politics. So you may have noticed that the points that I pulled out specifically in the statements all include the word care. The Latin root for the word curator uh, is cura, which means to take care. So it seems only right that we interrogate what it is that we are taking care of, especially in a time of upheaval and a time of need. So Somi, my first question to you, uh, besides uh, sharing with us how you have come to pen this opinion piece and the curatorial experience that informs this uh, statement, I want to ask a variation on the title of our conversation, which is um, what role do we curators play in times of need? Great, thank you so much, um, Liz. And um, thank you, Candice, for your wonderful um, opening presentation. It's really a privilege to be able to join everyone um, <clears throat> this evening, um, your time and <laughs> later my time in London. Um, I think that in, in terms of thinking about my text and um, you know, how it connects to a curatorial practice or a curatorial viewpoint, um, I would have to say that this text um, actually maybe surprised me <laughs> in terms of how I position myself um, in relation to museums and museum, museum practice as we were all sort of experiencing um, the social upheavals of 2020, not only the pandemic, but the kind of really significant trauma of um, George Floyd's murder and the sort of ramifications that that had um, on all factors and all layers of our society. And I think that it was a moment for me at least um, to take a stand um, in a way that maybe um, was attempting to think about how I could um, affect change within um, my profession um, and maybe taking some inspiration from the protests and the sort of outcry and the mobilizations that we all, all witnessed to um, over the summer of 2020. Um, so it was definitely kind of a moment of a self-reflexive moment of understanding where one stands um, in relation to thinking about questions of care in museums and cultural practice. Um, but I think really essentially, what are the values of the work that we do um, and how we as individual curators work in, in larger institutions, but also as a sort of um, generation of curatorial scholars, how we can, um, I guess, dictate um, the parameters of care um, for the future. Um, because I think that we depend a lot on a sort of prior way of working, um, values that have been kind of handed down through the institution. And as we know that those values and those method methodologies and ways of working are sort of tainted by the histories of colonialism and histories of violence um, that really birthed the museum as a sort of model. Um, so um, it was an attempt to kind of articulate oneself, I, I think, in the complexity um, of the moment. Um, it was interesting to hear um, Candice speak about um, toxic bodies um, and toxic objects and the question of the other and how um, museums have a sort of um, long term struggle <laughs> with this idea of toxicity um, and purity. Um, and not wanting to, um, I guess, maybe taint um, the purity of a museological practice or the purity of a sort of like knowledge center with the other, right? But the other always finds a way to kind of intervene, to kind of make itself present, um, whether or not it's through these objects and their sort of afterlives and the need to kind of tend to them in a different way or through the presence of other bodies who are always, I think, um, pushing at the edges of what museums think they should be offering to an audience, to a visitor. And I think always, um, you know, calling museums to task on their key responsibilities vis-a-vis uh, -a, -vis a sort of like civic 
um, contribution. And I think that's what we saw over the summer um, was that with the sort of closure of museums um, and um, the pandemic, uh, our relationship to museums changed fundamentally. Um, they were no longer spaces that we could go to for respite. They were no longer spaces where um, we might be dictated a certain um, knowledge base um, to, um, but we were still interested in connecting them to them in some ways. Um, and they were interested in connecting to us, but there was a huge gap, I think, in expectation um, on the part of museums that they would continue to work in the way that they've been working um, to keep the kind of relationships um, sort of um, the same while a broader context was really kind of changing very rapidly. Um, and what we saw over the summer with some of the difficulties around um, responding to the kind of um, social upheaval and the political kind of um, mobilizations, what we saw were museums um, attempting to kind of continue business as normal when the world outside um, had fundamentally changed. Um, and I think it's also related to that question of care, right? Um, in the moment where we were required to redeploy our sort of practices of care towards a society in need, towards communities in need, uh, we were found wanting, we were, we were in this moment of loss. Um, and I think that that just really highlighted the fact that we need to kind of recenter um, the values of care within the museum, um, but we also really, we need to redefine them um, for the 21st century. Um, and I think that hopefully that's what that text that I wrote um, starts to try to think about um, from a very personal perspective. But I think something that I hope for anyone who reads a text is that it is a sort of call to the collective, to the we, to everyone who contributes to kind of cultural life from curators as being the kind of key caretakers to civic um, institutions, uh, broadly speaking. So where does the museum sit in relation to kind of health provisions, in relation to our access to schools, in relation to our access to kind of social services, um, how we really need to retool kind of our kind of position to care, our positions in relationship to care, but also how as individuals, as museum goers, we also need to be implicated in this sort of um, redefinition of care within the institution um, and how this redesign, which I think is what I was suggesting in my text, has to intrinsically be kind of a collective endeavor um, and a collective endeavor that has to be initiated um, with the spirit of openness and kind of um, welcome um, to a broader group of um, interlocutors and to, dare I say, um, these sort of bodies that have historically been excluded um, and who are at the forefront of the call for repatriation, redress, repair, rest restoration, um, retreat. <laughs> um, all these words that I think that um, we have all individually felt um, through the pandemic and through the kind of um, difficulties of 2020. And so how do we kind of start to do that work um, together? Thank you so much for sharing your, um, your uh, thoughts on uh, where we are and uh, hearing you talk about the need. And in Candace's uh, introduction to her thinking, the two words that stuck out to me in relation to Somi's uh, framework of um, the a reimagining, a redesigning of care are the words vessels and cultural belonging, as opposed to a museum and an artifact. And this, I think, gives us a tool through which we can, with which we can uh, redesign. And this is very exciting to me 
Um, Candace, uh, would you like to jump in and uh, talk about these reframing, uh, in, especially um, in context of the collective work that we have to do in the museum that Somi is addressing? Yeah, Somi, I was really struck by, you know, your last comment, and it made me think that, you know, museums are, are interesting places, especially historic ones, because it seems as though the more they have of our stuff, whether it's things, you know, Indigenous culture belongings or, or things for, from elsewhere, the more they have of those things, the less they actually want to interact with those people as their audience because they want to claim those things for another audience, right? And that's kind of fascinating to me. So what you were proposing at the end was how we can offer a different kind of accountability. And through that, Liz, your proposition of reframing how we consider you know, the museum, like uh, at its very base level, we can consider it to be a vessel that is a container. Um, if it's a container, then what are the protocols of care that are within, within that container? One thing that uh, I've been thinking about a lot, and many of our colleagues have too, is even the words that are used. Um, Zomi, you were, you were talking about scientists who kind of come in or people who are, are put at this level of expertise and how they start to create their own vernaculars for things within these vessels or containers. One of them is artifact. And I've always took issue with that word because it implied that there was a radical break between uh, that thing and the culture in which it came from. Um, by mobilizing the term cultural belonging, you can, it implies that one, it belongs somewhere and its home might not be here where you see it right now. And on the other hand, it implies that it's part of a broader culture. It's not simply a thing because um, one of the issues that, that I've thought a lot about with regards to museums is actually how they're pretty bad caretakers. <laughs> they're not bad caretakers, not only of our things, but they're actually pretty bad caretakers of even us as human beings. Like a lot of the um, you know, just like climate control, it's actually for, for the objects and not for our bodies. So after a certain moment in time, you actually can start to become, feel very uncomfortable with the museum because it's just too cold, simply too cold. Um, but one thing that I wanted to put into sort of out there in the world was, you know, what if we do establish these different protocols and it's not just, you know, protocols around care and also to kind of speak back to the limits of knowledge, Somi, as you said, but also about, you know, what are the protocols of the things that are held within, within you know, museums themselves? How do, we, how do we think of them as active agents too, you know, not just us? So that's a bigger question that I have. And I think that's more coming out of, um, of course, working and collaborating with artists, because I think that they're actually the ones that are leading these conversations right now. And that's why I was quite struck too with um, Tanya Luke and Linklater's idea of visiting and it, with that visiting something that's in, in a museum collection. But within that, there's also kind of protocols of visiting. So before the gut skin parka that I showed the image of came to the Agnes Etherington, which is in Kingston, Ontario, she asked for its permission. So what does that mean for care? Like how do we actually show a kind of deep respect to all of the things that you know, we're working with and not just use them as illustrative. Um, so that, that was something that I wanted to put out in the world as well, because it's something that I've been thinking about a lot. Yeah, Liz, I love your um, kind of remapping <laughs> of um, the, the ideas of the vessel and cultural belonging. And I think the, um, the idea of the vessel, it doesn't have to be a closed vessel, right? And I think what's beautiful, the kind of um, this idea that a vessel can hold multiple things, um, but things can spill over from it as well, right? It's not contained. It's not finite. It can be refilled. <laughs> it can be emptied, you know, and that sort of constant replenishing that we might think about in relation to a container. Um, I think that that's a question also, like how do we replenish um, and maybe re-nourish um, institutions. And 
the work that they're doing, but also the objects that they're working with. And maybe this idea of um, how artists might intersect with some of these objects to kind of um, not, uh, not give them agency because the objects already have agency, but maybe to kind of amplify the sort of like existing agency to make more visible, um, to situate that agency in the present. Um, maybe that's something to do with kind of replenishing the work of the museum, as opposed to I think what previously is about kind of, again, holding things in stasis, right? Uh, carrying floor in a way where this object will remain pristine, quote unquote, untouched, quote unquote, um, and interpreted within a finite framework uh, with a view to kind of educating um, a mass. Um, so I'm really interested in this idea of the, how the vessel and as a kind of like tool that we can use in the everyday and we can start thinking about that in relation to museums. Now the question of cultural belonging I think is one that we strive to think about how museums can be meaningful to people um, beyond just the fact that they hold artworks that you can have exceptional experiences around. I think all museum professionals would say that they strive for there to be a sense of belonging in museums as they connect to their audiences and their communities. And I think the reality is that even though that's like an ideal, it's something that we strive for. I think it's something that we often fall short um, and we're still attempting in various kind of modalities of audience engagement, participation, different strategies, attempting to kind of like connect museums to um, the populace, to the people. Um, and I question why that is, why we have that struggle. If we are, again, as you say, we're a little bit kind of um, hindered by the way that we care in relation to objects and maybe an exclusive group of people in terms of artists, but that our reach doesn't kind of extend further to really kind of hold audiences and hold visitors in the right way that they do feel that sense of belonging. But I actually also suspect that the sense of belonging is there. It just might not be articulated in the way that we understand it or in the way that we want to kind of um, frame it in relation to our work. I think as cultural producers, we all know what it means to find meaning in institutions, to locate oneself in institutions, to locate one's cultural kind of belonging within an institution. And maybe that's too sentimental. <laughs> maybe something about it being a little bit over sentimental. Um, maybe we struggle with that idea in relation to kind of a broader scholarship around museum practice, but I think it's there. Um, and I think that we need to kind of learn to recognize the language um, and to amplify that and to celebrate that. Yeah, it's something you said, Somi, that stuck with me was um, you asked the question uh, when we last spoke about whether museums can have morals. And I liked that. And I was also then thinking, you know, we actually have an opportunity right now where there's a, a so-called identity crisis within museums because they realize and recognize it seems like all of a sudden their deficiencies are really, really rising to the surface, whether that deficiency is in the people that they've overlooked uh, in their collections, the kind of scramble to kind of rectify those gaps. And, but it's not just about collections. I think it's about audiences. It's about who's hired in, in those museums. So I think that there's an opportunity in this identity crisis. And I think that there's an op opportunity to think of museums or, or galleries or contemporary spaces as also su being subjective because the institutional voice is often never subjective. And that's where I think maybe that sense of belonging kind of gets, or, or even the idea of care uh, starts to get a little bit confused. I want to fold in a few questions that have been coming in um, because uh, I knew that this hour was gonna fly, but um, I think these questions are also pertinent to the discussion that we were just having in terms of uh, the museum uh, and 
it's um, I, the idea of it being a universal institution for a general audience. Uh, so I will ask a couple of questions in a combined way. Uh, one is, could the curator say a little about how different museums are implicated in the politics of curatorial care for communities they serve, for example? How might a museum like the Met, the Metropolitan Museum in New York, practice care versus a university art gallery like us or a local art museum? Uh, and also, um, how um, uh, could you say something a little more about the about how audiences can participate or extend a curatorial practice of care? And how would you like to engage with your audiences? Yeah, I think in, in terms of audiences, I think, at least for me, um, you know, audience is a part of the civic body, right? An audience is consists of all sections of society. And often within museums, the, I guess, voices that tend to um, have some sort of impact within institutions are kind of like a select few of the civic body, right? Um, high net worth individuals, you know, certain leaders. And I think that we need to kind of democratize um, which voices kind of uh, help museums grow and to develop over time. I'm always really curious of the fact that I think that at a certain point, at least in the US, um, there was a sort of complete erasure of community departments, community focused departments within museums. This went hand in hand with kind of trying to rethink education and how it works. Um, and right now we're going through a major crisis, especially within education, um, in institutions um, and thinking about what role do other kind of um, contributors make to institutions? I think as we move forward, I would like to see kind of community-based departments um, re-established, um, not only as a means to kind of, you know, do community-based projects, but as a means to maintain really important relationships that have a role in how communities are invested in museums from the position of advocacy um, in terms of kind of like advocating for a museum to exist, to continue to do its work, um, to just being kind of part of the life of museum as visitors, as contributors. I'm really interested to see what's gonna evolve as we've gone through this process of a really major crisis within education departments, a need for greater accountability in relation to a broader context and community, what new types of departments or what new types of kind of um, groups are gonna form in museums to help us kind of address this huge gap um, that I think has been kind of long brewing, never mind the kind of pandemic happening. Um, so I'm kind of intrigued in that. Um, I think advocacy is a really important word um, and I work, when I worked in the Chicago Architecture Biennial, we talked a lot about architecture in relation to advocacy, um, but also how, um, you know, we can develop a practice of advocacy as curators, as cultural producers. Um, and when I say advocacy, I think we're advocating for this change that we want to see, right? Um, we're advocating for these other voices, these other bodies to be included within museums. So maybe advocacy is a sort of next step from the sort of um, idea of protest and outcry, right? Maybe we move from something that seems very kind of heated and event driven and um, activist orientated to a type of like activist advocacy um, within museums. And how can you do that as a visitor? And I think it's also connecting or correlating what we exchange for our museum experience, whether it is kind of a sort of financial exchange um, or the fact that we're there contributing to the life of the museum 
and holding museums accountable for the fact that they have to deliver because if you are going to contribute in a certain way, we have to have certain expectations that are met. So how can we advocate for new expectations and new values within institutions as audience, as audiences? What you're addressing is so important, our responsibility as not only cultural producers, but responsible audience members. I think that is so important to think about for all of us uh, so that we don't become passive consumers uh, as Candace was talking about this voracious appetite um, of the museums to consume. Uh, mm -hmm. I wanna throw in one more question from the audience uh, and maybe ask Candace to um, think about these different types of museums and different communities they serve. This question uh, comes from an attendee who says, I think a lot about the identity of museums and wonder how we can reconceptualize them. What are your thoughts on particular measures? How or even whether, how even or whether this historically rooted institution can reinvent itself? Isn't its institutional setup and foundational history preventing its reinvention. In other words, can the museum be reinvented from within? Yeah. <laughs> so I think um, both from within and outside and both through the ability to make, you know, new spaces. I, I was thinking as Somi was talking about a potential model for the museum might also be as a kind of community repository. If you think of a museum that way, then you also have feel maybe some ownership or agency of the things that's contained within, within them. And one model that already exists is the Museum of Anthropology at the University of British Columbia. And uh, for family members who have things in that collection, there is there are ways that they can be borrowed back if there's if they're needed for, for ceremony or, for example, um, many of the things that they have actually, of course, have very particular protocols of care, particularly masks. Some masks, for example, need to be fed. They need to be part of, you know, dances at certain times of the year. And the museum is now realizing that the social life of objects needs to also be a kind of predicating on how people um, relate to that space. So that, that was an idea that I had as a kind of repository. Um, someone once said not that long ago in a kind of thread I was having about museums online that that they can't be augmented or or they can't be augmented successfully but I disagree because they augment themselves all the time depending on their interests um, and the other thing that I wanted to say about uh, about community and relations one obviously we can actually hold these spaces accountable we our interests can actually shape what is shown, how it's shown, who it's shown to. Um, but one thing I wanted to say is that it seems like the larger the institution, the more they lose focus of who their audience is. Um, and the larger, the, the more they lose focus of who that community might be. So one thing we've been thinking about lately, even with the Toronto Biennial is, what are the neighborhoods wh where we're in? Like it, maybe there's a neighborhood model rather than, uh, a community model because community is so, um, it's always already so multiple. Um, maybe if we start simply with, with place, because I think the larger the institution too, there's a confusion between audience and patronage, Somi, as you already said. So it seems like then there's a kind of uh, emphasis placed on patrons instead of the people coming because they don't know who the people are coming, that they don't necessarily know intimately the people who are coming. And Liz, you had mentioned the Met earlier, and I went to the Met to see the Diker exhibition because it had a lot of clink at work. And I must say that I was, I was really angry <laughs> at the labels. And it was clear to me that they had done very little to no community consultation of clink of people because they were still using words like witchcraft and sorcery. It was profound to me. And what I realized later was that it's because this was the language that attended the things when it entered their private collection. And then that language was still attended to when it entered the public collection. And so I think we need, museums need to think of communities also as repositories of knowledge, not just as audiences. <laughs>
That's a great and really powerful point. Um, I am thinking about the limits of museum as sites of knowledge um, and how do we offer um, the kinds of knowledge that we have as museum professionals as a mere starting point for mutual exploration and knowledge building rather than presenting information as conclusive statements that have a period at the end. And I want to bring in yet another question that is related to this from the audience uh, and maybe throw it at Sovi next. Um, we talk about museums as a place where we as audience members want to feel a sense of belonging in quotes. But does it also make sense uh, to think of a museum as a place to go when or if we want to encounter something that we don't know anything about, things that are unfamiliar to us and challenge us rather than things that we feel connected to. And I really appreciate um, where this question is coming from. So thank you. And uh, I would love to hear uh, Somi and Candace speak to this. Yeah, I mean, I think that, <clears throat> excuse me, obviously there's a history of the museum um, as a cabinet of curiosities, right? The sort of Wunderkammer um, model um, that is related to an idea of an encounter with other cultures um, that connects to a certain, certain sort of like European um, sophisticated class, right? Um, and being able to go into the museum as kind of the access point to the elsewhere, to the other, right? Uh, and this, this idea of like proximity, but through objects, through objects that have been mediated um, through processes of violence and dislocation and displacement. Um, so that idea of the challenge or the curiosity, I think is embedded um, in the DNA of institutions. And of course, I think we also think about artworks in relation to kind of artistic creativity as kind of a process of discovery, right? And maybe we're interested in accessing the sort of artistic mind um, through our encounter with our artworks, right? To kind of get us to that other way of viewing, that other framing of the world um, that is not part of our own individual, but part of what an artist can bring to the table. So I think this is all kind of weaved into um, how we consider the museum, but also artists and artworks. Um, I don't agree that belonging is something about comfort. And I think that belonging is incredibly complicated. So I can say, for example, I am a Londoner and I feel like I belong in London, but my relationship to London is incredibly complicated vis-a-vis -vis my status as a sort of migrant who arrived in London, um, you know, at the age of 10, who had to negotiate the transition from a sort of in a culture um, in the former colonies in Nigeria, the Commonwealth, with the kind of um, motherland <laughs> um, empire. Um, and I've had to negotiate with that sort of like culture. I've had to negotiate with the city, with my place in the city, my voice in the city, as I've grown up um, as an individual, as I've become sort of professionalized um, in my work and life. That sort of experience has never continuously been about comfort, right? There are moments of discomfort, there are moments of challenging oneself, of um, questioning one's place in the world, questioning whether or not I do belong or I don't belong, whether or not I need to leave in order to understand that I do need to be back here again. And so I think that belonging is really multifaceted. And if we think about belonging in that way, and not just about a sort of like comfort and a salve and a sort of like retreat, um, then we can understand that belonging is incredibly important to institutions. Um, your sense of belonging should continually be challenged. Um, you, you should be continually be renewed in your relationship to a place or to a space, right? Um, and I think that that is part of a sort of, um, sort of growth 
um, in one's life, but also in one's kind of like cultural understanding and our understanding of our, our places and place in the world. So how do we kind of think about belonging in relation to um, a sort of a more complex um, scenario? That was brilliant, Somi. I think you have <laughs> a solution with this idea of, of belonging. And I think the potential for that idea of belonging to be, uh, and I don't know if this necessarily works, but kind of like polyphonous, let's say, right? Because there's no singular belonging. And, you know, what if we can frame these spaces or even our encounter with them as we, as we kind of go in? Because the reason I love museums and galleries is because often what I see there is something that I know very little about. Um, so they're inherently spaces of, of mediation. There's just, you know, different levels of how, how that's done. Um, I also think that I always appreciate it when an artist's voice is privileged over an institution's voice um, because I think that, you know, I, 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 learned from, I learned from that. And I, and I'm, I always kind of balk a little bit when, um, this kind of authorial voice comes in because I question it immediately. I question, you know, where where the knowledge came from because they never talk about where that knowledge comes from when they say this artist is important because of this and their you know their work came up during this moment and and I shouldn't say that because I'm a curator, but it's I trust curators, but I think I I don't trust the institution as well as the curators. So I, I was thinking about how um, you know maybe there's possibilities as well when when you see something in a museum that the limits of knowledge are also exposed. Like for example, you know, what if you're, and, if, and I have seen examples of this, but what if you're to put something on display and you actually say, you know, what you don't know about it as opposed to the little that you do or the misinformation that kind of came along with it. Um, for example, that would have made a huge difference to what I saw at the Met exhibition, but that that is very, I think it's really threatening to, to museums to not be in the place as the holder of all knowledge, especially encyclopedic museums. Um. Thank you so much. I really do um, love the idea that uh, we can be a welcoming institution that can also be a very challenging institution and that we should hold both dear to our heart. Um, our time is almost up. Um, I want to uh, bring in one last question from the audience as a way to wrap up and maybe we can take turns quickly addressing some of the basic uh, steps um, that we can take in response to the question, which is many museums are not grappling with these issues. What are the ways that museum professionals can be leaders, advocates within structures that aren't always open to this work? And I'm happy to start. I can just say, um, just start talking to everyone around you. <laughs> I'll pass it on to Somi. I agree. I think we should speak and we should maybe not speak from a um, presumed position um, of kind of scholarly excellence of authority, um, we should speak with uh, the wholeness of ourselves, right? Um, and I think that the more that we feel courageous to do that, um, the more things will start to shift and the conversations will become much more richer. Um, and I think also we desperately need, and this is a call to you, Candice, um, we need to go back into institutions um, and we need to fight with them from, in, from inside. Um, I, I think that there, there are a lot of wonderful voices and wonderful scholars that have struggled to kind of exist within institutions um, because they are inherently very difficult places to affect change. And um, practices have been developed, very rich practices have been developed at the sort of like outskirts of institutions. I think we have a wonderful opening now to sort of go in and to try and do the work from inside. Um, I think that's also something that I would encourage um, other colleagues and peers to do to be fearless in kind of entering institutions um, because it feels like this is the best time <laughs> if there is no other um, that might kind of materialize in the future. 
Yeah, I think we can still raise our voices even from within side. And I've been hearing, you know, during this time uh, from many, many colleagues within education departments and within care trial departments of the change, changes that they're making and they're quite profound. They might be quiet uh, at the beginning, um, but I feel, you know, this is the first time in a long time that I felt really optimistic about you know, these changes that are happening, but they're happening as well because people from the inside can leverage critiques from the outside. So I think the two sometimes need to go hand in hand. Um, and I also think that museums or at least those of us who work within them or, you know, work to critique them from outside are also learning a lot from things like transformative justice and of course uh, equity. Um, all of these conversations are coming to bear on, you know, not just museums as, as, you know, repositories of things, but museums as human ecosystems that we've created in our own images. Thank you so much for both of your answers and for this hour together. And I know we have not gotten to all of the questions, even though Candace and Somi are guests in Buffalo virtually today. I am around and I am happy to continue this conversation with all of you. On that note, I want to share that UB Art Galleries is open uh, for in-person by appointment visits. So do drop in and sign up for our newsletter so you can find out about all the great work that we are doing. And I really hope that this is just the beginning of many conversations that we will all have in different threads that can be collectively woven to something stronger. So thank you. Thank you, Liz. Thanks, Liz. Take care. Bye, Bye. have a good evening. Bye.